Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Joshua mentioned this passage. That one of the values of preaching through, consecutively through Scripture, is you are forced to face things. Because I can't, t- I can't imagine in the course of a other, other type of preaching ministry where I would find myself saying, well, let's look at 1 Corinthians 6 today about taking one another to court. <laughs> I, that wouldn't come up naturally, but it comes up consecutively here. And we need to look at this today, how Christians are to respond in the public arena, how we are to show that the gospel of Jesus Christ is more precious to us than anything, anyone else. 1 Corinthians 6, looking at verses 1 to 8 today. If you'll stand with me, if you found that passage, if you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you so that you can read along with it. I, I, want, your, I want your senses to experience the Scripture. I want your eyes to see it. I want your ears to hear it. I, I want your minds engaged with it. You follow along as I read these verses. Remember now where we've come from. We've just spent the last three weeks looking at 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 13 on on redemptive, corrective church discipline. Think about that in the light of this passage. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother. And that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. We've read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And we, we want to hear the Lord speak to us today about how critical it is, the way we conduct ourselves, that we not bring shame upon the name of Jesus Christ to those outside. Thank you. Please be seated. We live in a very litigious society. People sue one another at the drop of a hat. You can't watch TV very long at all without a commercial coming on and say, have you been wronged? Well, we need to take, we're going to get you what you deserve. Just bombarded with the notion that the way to settle issues is to take another person to court. I don't know if people realize this, if you've never, uh, I've had friends who are attorneys who tell me about this, if you've never gone to court suing somebody, someone who thinks they have a claim against another person and wants to go sue them for a certain amount of money, the the attorney representing you more often than not will get 40 to 50 percent of whatever is won in the case. They're as bad or worse than the government. Whatever you think you had, just wait till they cut their part of the pie out. It's a business. Yes, there is a place for the law. Romans 13 teaches that. That we're to submit to those who who have the authority. God has ordained the authorities that that exist now. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But we've got to recognize that suing somebody is, is too easy in this country. Part of the reason you and I pay the medical insurance premiums we pay is because suing somebody is too easy in this country. That would be responsible litigation. I read yesterday, I think it was, people are now suing, follow me now, people on social media with Twitter accounts are suing politicians, public officials for blocking them from their accounts in the name of free speech, that I, you're, you're a public official, I have the right to say anything to you I want to say anytime. It is just gone mad. Add to that that we live in a day that's arguably 
public discourse is, is as hostile as perhaps it's ever been in, in public discourse. Now, people, historian friends of mine say, well, you need to go read what folks used to say to one another years ago, and I, I appreciate that. But they could not say it in the context of mass media. It was in a letter, or in a face-to-face -face conversation. You couldn't go on Facebook, like I read last night, and threaten to exterminate an entire race because you're angry about something. And here we come, followers of Jesus Christ, wading into the mix. When Paul addresses the immorality of, that he does in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and brings to bear the necessity of redemptive, corrective church discipline in that situation, he's basically saying to them, The world has heard that you are different. And yet what's happening in the church in Corinth now, even some of the folks in the world would repudiate. So he's shaming them for their, for their, for their loss of understanding about the significance of grace. And you're really going to see this if you hang with us next Sunday when we look at verses 9 to 11 when he delves into how a, how a misperception about what grace offers and grace affords can really seriously undermine the power of the message of Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners. So he chides them about that in 1 Corinthians 5. When he turns to 1 Corinthians 6, he's moved a little bit if you follow him. It's not just that something's happening in the church that's being made apparent and made aware outside the church and the nature of the case of immorality is such that the world, some in the world would blush at it. First Corinthians 6 is, you're taking your issues into the world to be settled. Remember the most important word in the English language according to my evangelism professor, Dr. Oscar Thompson, was the word relationship. We guessed all over the board for that, but he said relationship. God made us to be in relationship with one another. And one of the, I think one of the two words that, that essentially defines the gospel is the word reconciliation. If you've been saved by grace through faith here today, or if you desire to be saved by grace through faith here today, here's, here's the matter. You need to come to God repenting of your sin against him, asking for his forgiveness, not on the basis of anything you have to offer, but on the basis of what Jesus Christ did, how he lived, who he is, what he came to do, what he accomplished, and what God accepted. You need to be reconciled to God. God, every person within the hearing of my voice today that's outside of Jesus Christ, God has a controversy with you. You're under his wrath and his judgment. And the only way you settle that is on his terms receiving his offer of Jesus Christ as your advocate, your one who stands in your place. To be reconciled to God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, I plead with you, standing in Christ's name, I plead with you, be reconciled to God. And once a person is truly reconciled to God, then one of the infallible marks of that is being reconciled to one another, being willing to be reconciled to one another. The hallmark of a Christian marriage is not that Christians who are married never have problems. The hallmark of a Christian marriage is that Christians who are married to one another know how to come to the foot of the cross to resolve their problems. And Paul is increasingly frustrated. Notice, if you've been following with us this whole study, he was frustrated that the Corinthians were choosing one preacher over another. Well, I like Paul. I, well, I like Apollos. Well, I'm, I like Peter. But Paul says, stop that nonsense. The message of the cross is not divided. You were not preached to by these people to choose which one you like better. You were preached to by these people to come under the sway of the message of the cross. So we have this issue. 
They've taken their problems to the world to solve them. I've seen it over and over. Some of you here have lived it in this very place. Or when trouble arises, then we go to, what would the world do? One of the great tragedies in the, in the so-called conservative resurgence of the Southern Baptist Convention was when, and I, I, had, uh, I had come out of my master's and was gone back working on my doctorate. And the, and the president at, South, at Southwestern Seminary, was, he was, he was, I wasn't a big fan of his, but he was the president. I owed him that respect. And a majority of the board of trustees became conservatives through the process that takes place over years. And so at a trustee meeting with supposedly all Christians in the room, all from Southern Baptist churches, some pastors, some lay people, they decided that in order to, to address the problem they had with the president of that institution, which at the time was the largest seminary in the world, they went and changed the locks on the doors of his office while he was out. Hijacked him, just like in a corporate takeover. It was ugly, it was awful, it was a stain and a denial of the gospel. And that's what Paul's after here. You're, you basically are saying to Corinth, we've been saved by grace through faith. But Paul says, the way you act, you deny it. You deny the gospel. And so he speaks to these things. This passage is one of those rare ones I tried in my bed. It just it practically defies outlining because of how Paul is dealing with this here. So we're just going to look at it a verse at a time. Now Paul has just come out of this. Purge the evil from among you, verse 13 of chapter 5. Purge the evil from among you. And when he, when he says that and says this next, then you know that Paul is not saying that the only evil that is present in the church in Corinth is an immoral man. He is at the heart of it. Because if you read that, purge the evil from among you when one of you has a grievance against another. Does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Paul asks, what fellowship, what do you have in common at the core with unbelievers? He's thinking about that now. You dare? It hasn't happened often in my ministry, but it's happened a couple of times. A fellow walks up to me. Karen and I were out shopping. Now I knew the person, so we recognized our eyes met, and he said, I want to ask you something. He said, is so-and-so a member of your church? Well, now, I didn't go into the excursions to tell him it's not my church, it's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I happen to be pastoring. For the sake of brevity, I said, well, this person was, but they left our church to join another church. Why? He said, he's suing me. Did you teach those folks that Christians aren't supposed to sue other Christians? Not a very enviable place for a pastor to be. And I said to him, if I had known this while this person was still a member, we would have addressed it as a congregation. Paul's concerned here. He uses the word dare, it's a word that expresses shock. I'm shocked that I would hear this. And he says they have a dispute. This idea of dispute, it's really, it's, if, you, if you could look it up in its original, it's a, it's a term that was used for going to court over a lawsuit. So he's clearly got them heading into the, the, the Corinthian courts. Think about this for a moment, folks. Christianity is a fairly new expression in Corinth. And we're going to read a laundry list next week of people from, from all, all aspects of immoral lifestyles. 
He's going to rattle off this laundry list. And he's going to say this glorious thing, and we're going to look at, and such were some of you. The, the courts in Corinth were probably not beaming examples of righteous justice. So Paul's concern is that two believers, two people, there was only, you couldn't get mad and go to the second Baptist church of Corinth. There was only one church in Corinth. They were kind of stuck together. Two professing Christians, one has gotten into a, an issue, property, a failure to be faithful to, a, to an agreement. And they've taken that. Rather than for the sake of Christ, rather than to work out the beauty of the gospel of being reconciled to one another, they've taken that to the Corinthian court. Now Paul is, again, he's not naive. He, he would stand and speak. Uh, if you want to look just real quickly, Acts 18, verses 12 and following, Paul stands before uh, Gallio, he was the proconsul of Achaia, and the Jews had attacked him. Paul at one point appeals to Rome. I mean, there's a place to go to court, so we're not, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. And I hope we can flesh this out, let you see that, that when redemptive, corrective discipline fails, In other words, when a, when a professing Christian fails to act like a Christian as we work them through the issues that Jesus and Paul outline on that, then as surely as you treat them as a heathen and a publican that Jesus says in Matthew 18, they're acting like a non-Christian. And Christians, in certain cases, need to appeal to the courts to be, to be protected from non-Christian activity. The courts are legitimate. They're not the first place to run when you have a dispute in the church. You get, so that's try to keep the balance here. And so he says in verse 2, or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Now, if, you, if you're remembering 1 Corinthians 5, you're going to remember that he said that in verse 12, for what, what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges outsiders. Well, he's not contradicting himself here. When he says the saints will judge the world, he's talking about at the consummation of the age. Now look at uh, Daniel 7.22, just to kind of get a flavor of that. It talks about when the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. When they, so, so the saints will be a part of this final consummation judgment. Where the unrighteous, where the wicked will be cast into outer darkness. And the angels will cry hallelujah over and over as the unrighteous are cast into eternal damnation. He's talking about the consummation. Age. He's not talking about the disputes going on right now presently. So make sure you're, you're tracking with him here. He said, the saints will judge the world. And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Notice what he's done, argument from the greater to the lesser. If God is going to have you seated in judgment upon the world at the end of the age, the greatest judgment a person could ever have to make, are you not competent to judge by any, comp any comparison, something trivial, something temporary, something not eternal. So the difference is 1 Corinthians 5, 12 is about, about temporal judgments. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 is about the judgments as eternity is ushered in. He doesn't tell us what the issue is. What he's dealing with here is that, that because they have the mindset that that's the first course of action. I like 
what Linda did with the bulletin. In God we trust. No, second thought, I'll see you in court. That's the mentality that they're saying to their neighbors, in God we trust. We trust in the living God who gives, gave his son Jesus, and we're following him. But so-and-so wronged me. And I'm going to do what comes naturally. See, that's, that's the problem, isn't it? Is the clash of the supernatural and the natural. And brothers and sisters in Christ, if we're not, if we're not in the word, getting washed by the word, we're in, if we're not in prayer, if, if we're not in fellowship with, with the believers, if we're not walking together in brotherly love, exhorting one another, you can have a natural reaction to something rather than a supernatural response. And that's what Paul is troubled about here. 1 Corinthians 6, 3, do you not know that we're to judge angels? So, I mean, the, so the stakes are really high. Not only are we going to judge the world, we're going to judge angels. Remember Psalm 8. We looked at that recently on Sunday nights. What is man that you take note of him? You, you've made him a little lower than the angels, but, but he'll be crowned with glory. He'll be above the angels in glory. The angelic beings, a third of whom fell with, with Lucifer, will be judged by the saints. How much more then matters pertaining to this life? If God in his divine wisdom entrusts the saints to judge the unrighteous and the angels at the end of time, how much more should you be able to? to handle matters pertaining to this life within the congregation. So he's really, he says he's, he's ashamed and he's pressing them, showing them the, uh, the folly, how they're probably well-intentioned something they'd grown up seeing and doing is not going to have a good effect on the gospel in Corinth. Let me say parenthetically, churches that fuss and fight and have a reputation for that and split and go this way, it, it just, there's, there's always a group going, well, we showed them. Yeah, but what did you show them? Show them you can, you can check the gospel on the side that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation until I don't get my way? So he says in verse 4, so if you have such cases, now cases, there's apparently more than one of these going on. Why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? Why would you appeal to the authorities? Paul says, would you, would you bring the authorities inside your meetings to give you counsel on how to, how to conduct yourselves? Would you bring somebody who's not reconciled to God into your midst to help you be reconciled to one another? Doesn't that somehow send a message that the cross of Christ is great, but it's not enough? He's being ironic here, clearly. The civil authorities whom we are called upon by God to, to respect. Right, let me say parenthetically, I, I despise the things that are being done to our president, not because I'm a supporter of our president, but the, but the level the open threats that he be assassinated, the calls for him to be murdered, the, 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 the temerity of people, to, it, just, it, is just, it is a mark of how far we have fallen as a civil society. And Paul says here, yeah, submit to kings, he's written that. 
but you don't bring them in. They may, they may force their way in, which they do all over the world right now with our brothers and sisters in Christ, but you don't bring them in to help you be better Christians. They have no standing. That is, they, they would, for them to stand and speak in a Christian assembly, can you see how that would mock it? It would be an abomination for that to happen. Paul says, all you've done is you, you simply circumvented. You haven't invited them in. You've gone to them. And for Paul, that's the same thing. In verse 5, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? What's he saying there? Have you, have you surveyed the Corinthian church and concluded that the people there are so dull, you couldn't trust them to give you a good perspective on your problem. Your problem is so great that you can't trust your brothers and sisters to give you a reasonable response. And so you're taking it to people, probably virtual strangers. I've watched the most amazing things through the years. I'm doing marriage counseling. I think of one particular couple, and I said to this, to one party in the couple, I said, here's what I, what I need you to do. I need you to do this and this, and it, it, involved, it involved being sure that we could get a good reading on what was going on. And this person just refused and just put me off and put me off, was offended that I would suggest it. And so then I followed this matter when it finally went to court, when they were suing one another for divorce. And I sat there, and this judge, who was a total stranger to this person, I said, all right, I'm ordering you to do this, 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 this. The response was, yes, ma'am. Now, I bit my tongue because I want to walk up and go, help me here. <laughs> you don't even know that person. You, didn't, you hadn't seen that person before today. I've known you for almost two decades. Help me here. That's Paul's frustration that they're willing to go to outside sources to seek counsel, deliberation, and judicial decision and don't have enough. It, it really says something about how we do not love one another. When we look around and go, no help here, I'm going to the court. So he's, what he's calling for here is for an ar arbitration climate. Again, the person refuses arbitration, refuses to be reconciled, pushes it, pushes it, becomes recalcitrant. Then you finally take the action, the, the severe action we've taken recently of excommunication. And you hand them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that their soul might be saved. You treat them as a heathen and a publican. You're not talking about the same matter then. You might be aggrieved and need to be protected from them. But if that's the first place you go is to the courts, then you have undermined the gospel. 1 Corinthians 6, 6, he says, but brother goes to law against brother. And that before unbelievers. And then it's a present tense here. But you folks keep on doing this. You, you know, you, there's, there's nothing been learned here. You take the trouble and so what happens? Do you think this raises the esteem of the court for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me tell you what it does. They don't differ from anybody else. That's what they're saying. They don't differ. The church, oh, I know, yeah, they, they're not any different from anybody else. And then what do we offer them? A powerful gospel that changes lives. And they say, yeah, we're glad, glad you're having fun with that. Then verses 7 and 8. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already defeat. Here, what was he saying here? You go to court thinking because that's the only place I can have any hope that I win. And Paul says when you make that move to court, you lose no matter what comes out of it. You have lost. Why? Because your witness for the gospel has lost. Your testimony that the gospel is powerful. That's what I try to tell couples over and over and over when they want to get a divorce and they claim to be Christians. You are trampling the gospel underfoot. What you've said is that the gospel is the power of God to salvation unless you happen to live with my spouse. And it's not powerful enough there. I hate divorce. 
And I've seen it in my family, and I hate it. It is a blight. Because the gospel basically says, you there, sinner saved by grace. You there, sinner saved by grace. Yeah, different, different backgrounds, different, different, all kind of stuff different. But if you'll promise to follow Jesus Christ, and if you'll promise to follow Jesus Christ, if you'll promise to repent of your sin when you sin and forgive when you sin against, if you promise to repent of your sin, and, and, and we're going to show something very powerful to the world. Okay? Paul says the gospel is at stake here. And you know me, don't, don't let the devil say, well, he doesn't believe in divorce. I hate divorce, but Jesus and God give grounds for divorce in the scripture. So, so clearly, I'm, I'm, I've dealt with that with you before, so I'm not going to rehearse that. But the point is, love covers a multitude of sins. And then he says something that just blows you away, because I'm telling you, I hear this and I go, whoa, am I... Am I I'm willing to do this. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? And then he gets him with this double-edged sword. He says, the problem is what has set this in motion, this, this tragedy of Christians going to, to heathen courts to settle their disputes is that before that happened, but you yourselves wrong and defraud. Because there's, there are people doing wrong to others, which has been met with the response of, well, because you've done me wrong, I'm going to the courts. And Paul says, that's wrong. So it's a failure to love. It's a failure to repent. It's a failure to forgive when, you, when we repent. And Paul, I told you when we started this, path, this, this study through 1 Corinthians, this is a perfect gospel for an imperfect church. And Paul pulls no punches. He spent 18 months in Corinth starting, planting this church. And he's troubled at how when they would say they have come out from among them, they've come out from the culture, that they seem to have brought the culture with them into the church of Corinth. And we're going to see more and more of this before we get through this study. Or they did not come out from among them and be separate. Rather, they just packed up what they were, and they came right on through that, that wicked gate, that small gate. You're not supposed to be able to get through the gate with a whole bunch of luggage and baggage, but that's what they say they've done. So I think Paul is wondering at some point, are you even really Christians if you carry on like this with impunity? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. And of course, it reminds us of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. This is not a new idea. This is not Paul the revolutionary. Matthew 5, 39 to 42. Jesus in teaching his manifesto, a new way of living. But I say to you, do not resist the one who's evil. But if anyone slaps, and he's not talking about resist the devil, that's it, we're not getting into a contradiction here. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him, the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. He's, I hear he's talking about what happens to Christians when civil authorities press upon them, try to take advantage of the call to humility and Christ-likeness. Give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. That's Jesus, manifesto, Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Why? So the Christians can be the world's doormats? No, so that the gospel can be seen for the power that it has. Because I'm going to tell you something, folks. Bill Askell, by nature, isn't going to turn a cheek to somebody that smites me on one. Only way that happens is the gospel the gospel, that you stop and you think, wow, for the sake of Christ, if, if I can win this person, I need to bear this reproach. And so Paul has, has called them, and he's called them out. 
How do we work this out today? Well, here's, here's the short. Um, when disputes arise, and they've arisen in the past here, in, in your past, when, when disputes arise, then you sit down with, with the leadership and you say, let's, let's work through them. You may not know this, but I, not just here, but other places, when you, when you pastor and you press the gospel, interesting things happen. I've had people say to me, well, I'm, I'm going to get rid of you. And I say, well, there's a way to do that. I mean, I can walk you through the stages of it, but it's, it's, there's a gospel path to deal with those kind of issues. In other words, the gospel is the power of God. It is sufficient. The church, Lord Jesus Christ, can sit down, hammer out its differences, come to biblical conclusions in a way that honor God. Folks aren't typically interested in that, that when, I, when I offer the path, not many want to travel it because it's a path with a sword that has two edges in it. I've not done as well at this as I had hoped I would when I started my ministry. But I've said to everyone, every church I've ever served, every person I've ever had a conflict with, I want to be reconciled to you. For the sake of the gospel, I want to be reconciled. Nope. No. 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 Tragic. It's tragic. So the question I leave you with: Are you willing, for the glory of God? We don't. We don't have anybody suing anybody here that I that I know of. I, like I said, I was approached uh, not that terribly long ago by somebody in town who was concerned that the person he thought was a member who was a former member was suing him. Um, Are you willing to deny yourself for the greater glory of God? Are you willing, when, when wrong comes, to gather the collective wisdom of the local congregation to hammer it out? Are you willing to repent when you're sinned against, develop that, what we call that repentant attitude initially? You can't formally I'm, I'm, pardon me, forgive when you sin against, and you can't formally forgive somebody until they, until they repent to you, but you can functionally have a forgiving attitude. Are you willing to repent when you sin against someone else? You see, that's practicing the gospel. And when that kind of beautiful motion sets in on a congregation, I can tell you, number one, there's not many places in the world that you see that. Number two, there's not many quote, so-called churches in the world where that's practiced. It makes you unique. It makes you have a powerfully compelling testimony to the power of the gospel that Jesus Christ's death on the cross did level the wall that stood between us, did make of himself one new humanity in Christ. That the gospel is the answer to the world's ills. I'm going to tell you something. There were people at that protest yesterday on both sides who go to church I'm sure of it. And racism is hateful. And it's heresy. And it's an assault upon the Creator who made us in the image of God. So we've got to, we've got to step forward. I've got to start with me. You've got to start with you to speak a reconciling word, to ferret out our prejudices, our, our willingness to pull the trigger of the world too quickly when the devil throws an issue in the middle of the church and show that Jesus really is the way, the truth, and the life, that his word is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. And that everything that was written in the Scriptures was written for us. That we might have hope. We've got to rise above the Christianity that has a Bible open until something goes wrong and goes, that's it. I had a fellow say to me, I'm going to close with this, I promise. Years ago, I was dealing with a dispute, talking to him. 
He was mad because we had gone to try to rescue his daughter who was living in sin with a man. Trying to talk to him at church. And he said, preacher, let me tell you something. He said, I run heavy equipment for a living. He said, when they first put me on that heavy equipment, I had my manual, my owner's manual out, learning how to run it. Because I kept bringing scripture to him. I said, well, the word of God says. And he said, but the day came, preacher, when I closed that owner's manual and put it down and I ran the equipment. I said, are you, I'm trying to follow your analogy here, are you suggesting that it's time to put the Bible down? And he just looked at me. That was exactly what he was saying. He might as well have said, I don't care what the Bible says. Here's how I feel. And when that happens, the gospel is gone. And if the gospel is gone, there is no remedy. There is no remedy. Rioting in the streets. Hate, hatefulness. Hating and being hated. Bloodlust. And that's where you and I live. That's this, this is the society we're going to raise our children and grandchildren in. And it'd be easy to go tuck and run, get in bed, pull the covers over your head. That doesn't answer anything. But we do have the answer and we have the remedy. But it starts in our believing it personally, practicing it con congregationally, and then sharing it with a world that is hurting and doesn't want to hurt, but doesn't know how to stop the hurt. Paul tells us the gospel of Jesus Christ is a call to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, follow him. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, I, I invite you to come to know him today. Whatever turmoil is going on in your life, it'll only be turmoil and only get worse until you come to the foot of the cross. Only there can you sing it as well with my soul. For those of us who are Christians, let's commit today to redouble our efforts to live as Christ followers because you're going to hear an awful lot of nonsense this week if you simply open your ears. We better be ready to give an answer to everyone whether they ask us whether they see hope in us or not I pray they see hope give an answer where hope is found in the cross the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ let's pray Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you today and we look at this and Lord, as I read about the whole issue of courts, I pray, I pray for marriages that, that we'd be able to stay out of the courts. God have mercy. I pray for our congregation, Lord. I thank you for the men and women who who name the name of Jesus in this place, and I pray that you will protect us from the evil one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And he would like to turn us on one another. He'd like to convince us the only remedy is to, is to walk away or the only remedy is to go to the courts. I pray, dear God, that we will commit to the transforming power of the gospel, the reconciliation that comes between us and you, and then by your power, between us and one another, help us to shine as a beacon to this dark and decaying generation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.